The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. It's like you're boxing. All right. So we have returning lineup guest for for listeners who want to check out the original episode which got a lot of um positive feedback that's from all the way back in february 2020 um and i think i think when you and i recorded the first time we were like yeah we're about to go to australia it's another year and then within weeks like covid started hitting and then i think you and i were like you're still going right i'm like yeah i'm still going this will probably be out of the news in a week or whatever and then did not happen but we'll get into that we have stab Editor at large, I think that's your title, and producer extraordinaire Ashton Goggins. Uh, Ashton, thanks, thanks so much for coming back on the lineup. Oh, thanks so much for having me, man. Uh, it's been way too long since I've seen you in person, but it's been nice being on the road, being able to listen to your voice on the podcast. I well, I appreciate that, and and yeah, and I mean that's related, I think, to the the very first time we recorded again. Like you and I are a little bit of road dogs, right? And we're like, okay, cool, yep, going to Australia, that's the rhythm of life, then we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do that. We got all these projects, obviously, in our own lanes. And then I know you and I stayed in touch, like, when, obviously, when COVID was happening, and then, you know, after a while of just being like, well, it's another six weeks, so it's another eight weeks, so it's another two months. I don't know what's happening with my projects, what's happening with your projects. It's like, no, we're kind of tethered to one place for a, a longer amount of time than we probably had been for, for a while. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Just what that transition was going from where we talked last time, where you were traveling quite a lit, lot to the entire world being fairly static in one location and then, and then now being able to travel again. Oh man. It was like, I felt like a ship running aground. Uh, I think the last time we talked, I had just done my first year on tour doing no contests where we were doing like a full blown travel show with Red Bull. And I like felt like I just found a groove. I was like, oh, I know how to do this show. We're going to a few new spots. Like we're going to G land. And then it was like, Burr. and yeah, I got locked down in LA and didn't really know what to do as far as like movement. I didn't want to go home and like be near my dad who's older. So I just locked in at the office and actually lived at the stab office for like nine months. And that was when I started making Andy Irons and the Radicals. And I just like dove into that project. And at the same time, Australia was pretty locked down as far as movement between states. So it was really hard for those guys to get any sort of projects done down there that were like sort of broad scope. So we had to do a ton of stuff in California during COVID, you know, just doing different profile uh, videos and series for some of the brands and stuff. And so we were busy, dude. I felt like all we did was work for that whole time. It was like everyone that was on staff was working from home and then coming into the office here and there and just starting to sort of build the catalog that would end up being Stab Premium. We like took advantage of that time. And at that point was, you know, even Taylor Paul, who's now the editor of Stab Premium, at that point, he had just spent like probably a year and a half putting together stab travel and it was this whole new you know project of uh you know creating a real like platform for surfers interested in international travel and of course that was like boom and then he turned his attention to stab premium with sam and everything sort of started heading in that direction um and yeah that was like the year that we built everything with that you know we did um the acid test with mason and coco we did stab in the dark with taj we did those surf 100s with Jody Nelson and Sal. Um, yeah, it was just like, I, when, I, when I look back at that period, we like made a list of all the projects we did during the pandemic and we were like, oh, it was so heavy. But it made us realize that we could make content that quickly, that we could make a, pro, you know, a really serious project at, you know, between 15 and 30 minutes each week. Uh, and once things turned back on, we were like ready for it, you know? It's interesting you brought that up too, because I'm thinking back during that window and, and that was when, even though we'd had these design conversations before the lockdown, like again, like we kind of were like, well, 
were once we realized that the 2020 season was not going to happen and that um, 2021 was looking a lot more like kind of a, a hybrid year, we really dug into the redesign of the tours and competition framework where we're saying, okay, cool, we're going to we're going to upend the calendar. We're going to create this calendarization between this new three tier system. We're going to have this, you know, mid season relegation. We're going to have the, the, the WSL finals. Um, and I wonder like if we didn't have that, basically like we all got sent to our rooms to spend our time on something. I wonder if we didn't have that, if, if we would have rolled all those changes out as quickly as we did, I kind of doubt it. And I wonder too, if you ever think about that, like if Stav premium would have happened on the same expedited timeline, if it was just business as usual in 2020. Oh, no way. Uh, what's the, there's like, I forget who or coined the phrase, or maybe Naomi Klein, but uh, you never let a good crisis go to waste. Mm. And I think that that was sort of everyone's thinking on our side, like we still had our jobs, you know, we still were like able to work doing what we were doing if we did it creatively and being locked down, like what better way to spend our time than just trying to make surf movies. And for me and Sam Moody and for Will Stiles and, you know, Dylan for the whole crew, it was like an opportunity to like learn how to make documentary films in a weird, in a real way. Um, and I'm, it was, you know, I'm really proud of how everyone took advantage of that time and was so productive because it came out the other side with like a confidence in the products that we had to offer, you know, being able to roll out Stab Premium with like a four part, four hour series about Andy Irons was like my dream. And I think it was really cool for Sam to sort of see his vision for a subscriber supported media platform for it to be validated by all these projects that everybody was so excited to put behind the paywall. Um, mm. and then to see all the surfers come behind it after that and just sort of for it to gain momentum as things turn back on. Um, I think that everyone realized that they'd sort of used that time to the best of their abilities to really like keep moving forward. You know, like I've seen it for a long, long time. You've seen it too. When, you know, a staff member or a journalist or a surfer for whatever reason, you know, life changes, career changes, you fall off tour you're a part of this circus, this traveling circus, um, for so many months out of the year. And that's sort of the, again, like the rhythm of your life. And sometimes it's five years, sometimes it's 10 years, sometimes it's 20 years. And then when that stops, like people are very candid about like, it's a struggle going from, you know, every other week I'm traveling to some other part of the world to now I'm here, you know, and we all kind of had to deal with that. Obviously, in that that period, you talk a lot about uh, look, we dove into this work, but it, outside of the work stuff, was it a struggle for you just to be, as you put it, like a ship run aground? And if so, you know, how did you deal with it? Like, I mean, did you get into bread baking or yoga or like whatever <laughs> whatever people got into at the time? You know, uh, oh, it was gnarly. I was stuck in L.A. and. I had the bright idea to try and rehabilitate a French bulldog <laughs> who was <laughs> sure. a super aggressive stud that I adopted and was trying to like rehabilitate in Venice. And he was so terrible with people and other dogs <laughs> and anything else that I was just like isolated in an office space in Mar Vista with this 45 pound French bulldog for like nine months. <laughs> and it made it so that all I did was work and play music. And at the time I was just starting to uh, date my now wife who was stuck in Brazil at the time. And so I would dive through archives of old VHS tapes from the lost years, trying to find footage of Andy and all those guys for the movie during the day and then doing stab projects wherever we needed to do them. And then at night I would just record music because we had this like soundproof room at the office. So I had a bunch of mics and guitars and stuff in there and I would just record music and me and my wife would just send back and forth songs. And it was like a year of that. It was just like rhythm every day. That's all I did. I walked my dog, cruised around, worked on surf films and then recorded music. It was like, and for, I think being on tour, there was times where I, that was like what I missed about like domestic life was just like having a rhythm, being in the same place every day. Even if you couldn't do much, it was like, I tried to take advantage of it as much as I could. Um, and yeah, it was, and then we moved the office down to Oceanside and that was like a whole new process of like slowly sort of gathering everyone in one space again 
and getting them sort of excited about having time back in the office and in a, you know, a space that felt really conducive to um, working on all the projects that we were sort of starting to tee up as things turned back on. And then it went straight into the Australian office coming back on doing the SURF series and then Stab Highway for the first one. And it was like both teams all of a sudden had all this new freedom to go and do all this stuff that we like, teed up during the, the pandemic. And it was just like, boom, there was so much to do. It was insane. <laughs> I mean, the way you describe it, too, uh, in a way, that might have been the best option for a courtship with your now lovely wife is a little bit remote, a little bit kind of high fidelity exchanging music, as opposed to if you're in the same space and you're like, most of my days are spent um, uh, working and sleeping in an office uh, during a pandemic by myself with my only company, like an ornery um, dog. Um, maybe that wouldn't have been the best, like, you know, like <laughs> introduction to the relationship. So I think you guys nailed it on the, like, look, we made the most of the situation. And then I was adjusted by the time, you know, we were able to uh, get married. Yeah. Going from like, uh, this perceived like vagabond traveling, you know, like post <laughs> to a, uh, <laughs> a bulldog rehabilitator. It was like the least romantic period of my life, I'd say personally, but the, like the, it was such a nice experience uh just having that time to just spend on music that i've always wanted to since i was a kid uh but to have it just be something just between the two of us instead of it me being worried about playing music for fucking anybody else because that's my nightmare like the guy that picks up the guitar at the campfire for some reason it's yeah. like it just like ugh. yeah <laughs> well, i i know i know i played wonderwall last night but let's give it another whirl everyone yeah exactly <laughs> Um, so 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 this is the the first new podcast that we've recorded since the completion of the 2022 Rip Curl WSL finals. And as someone who sits at the nexus of, of surfing news and opinion worldwide, I want to get your kind of unfettered thoughts on the performances of, of both the men and the women on, on the final day of the season. What did you where, oh, number one, where did you watch it from? And then number two, what, what were your thoughts on all the finalists? Um, I watched it in Florinopolis. We were in Brazil uh, filming the last episode of No Contest, and we were down there with Matias Hurdy and Tomas mm -hmm. Hermes and his wife and a whole crew um, and a lot of Felipe's very close friends. And also for me, I'm like, I'm down there full gringo. I work for stab. I've already got like marks against me in these, in these situations. <laughs> and, uh, I was just rooting for Jack Robinson only because I'm rooting for Leandro Dora. And I've, I feel like Leandro Dora is the like hidden guru of surfing that people should be fucking talking about all the time. The guy is a sage and what he's been able to do with Jack is, incredible like it should whatever he's done whatever like uh whatever mental training and gymnastics he's put him through over the last year people should be taking note and trying to figure out what he's doing because it's special uh, but yeah anyhow back to the finals the finals were amazing i think that people were expecting it to be a dud because of how insane last year was just as far as the conditions go so it was going to be hard to live up to that no matter what but then seeing the forecast and seeing the hurricane and all that, I was like, they've got a window. And I think you guys nailed it as far as what you guys had to work with. And it gave everyone a really, to my mind, like an even sort of playing field in conditions that for most people are the most relatable conditions on the planet. As much as like I want to see the finals you know, go down in heavy waves like everybody else because I'm a core surfer, it's undeniable the appeal that high performance surfing in relatable conditions looks like when there's that much on the line in that environment. And there's certainly other waves that would be just as conducive as lowers, but to do it in Southern California, to me, it's there or Malibu and that's it. Right. And it's interesting too. Like, I, I mean, obviously we're in the second year of this and you know, the first year we had great waves, like this year we had a hurricane. And 
over the course of the season, like talking to a lot of the championship tour surfers, just about future planning, like five-year planning, 10-year planning, et cetera. And there's a variety of topics that, you know, we go through. And one of them is the finals location. And time and time again, I think after seeing it happen last year, it wasn't that I was surprised, but I was maybe surprised by how consistent this feedback was from the CT surfers where they put such a premium on high performance neutrality for the finals venue. You know, they're like, look, like just to punch your ticket to have a shot at the world title, you have to compete at Pipeline, Sunset Beach, Super Tubos, Bells Beach, Margaret River, Garagigan, um, Punta Roca, Sakuraima, Jeffries Bay, Chopu, like... They, they're like, you have to compete at all these spots just to get a ticket here. And so the venue for them, they're like, it just, you know, if it's a right hand point break or a left hand point break or whatever, they're like it, the most neutral high performance canvas you can find is kind of the priority in terms of selecting where we go. And I mean, as you pointed out, like it's, it's hard to go past lowers when it's when it's on you know you got a left and right it's the performances of the surfers decide who wins as opposed to maybe some of these other locations it's like if you get the right wave like the wave decides who wins kind of thing and so um but it was interesting too you know and and, and the other kind of thing that that i noticed it's like we've obviously had three out of the four number one seeds between last year and this year take home the world title as well as Carissa surfed all year, it, it's like for me, if we had to rip the Band-Aid off the number one seed not winning the world title in this format, like seeing then seven-time world champion Steph Gilmer go from the fifth seed through the field and claim her eighth world title is almost the best case scenario, I think, to prove out the format because she was just on and she made history. And it's like it's a moving forward, it's like, hey, like anyone can win this. It's not, if you train hard enough and you're performing well enough, like there's, there's no reason you can't win just because you're not the number one seed. Yeah. It's like the best worst case scenario that people could throw at the format, you know, like what if this happens, you know, what if the fifth place person just has this fluke thing? Uh, but when you see someone like Steph do that, like claw her way out of the first heat and then just carry that momentum heat after heat after heat until you're going, she's going to win it. Like, to me, whatever, that's what's going to engage people forever to talk about that event. Everyone will talk about that event because of how it went down. It, it, that conversation usurps conditions or, you know, any of those things. Just the like sheer drama of it is a proof of concept to me. And of course, you guys can improve upon it with, with certain ways or there's going to be certain years that are going to be better than others. But I think that you guys know that it works now. You know the challenges of wave conditions that have neutrality and challenging aspects to them and consistency, but then also that it tick the boxes of being able to do them in places that can draw real crowds and have real energy on the beach. You know, I think that those places, once you fill all those concentric circles, there's only so many places you can do it. And the one place that I would love to see that event would be at Rocky Point. That's the one place that I feel like people have never done a contest that's the most undervalued, all conditions, like fucking wave on the planet. Would Rocky rights or Rocky left or the whole, the whole point? The whole thing. Think about it. You could be hard. Like, be, you'd have to set up like two judging structures. Though. It'd be hard to like be one space and kind of judge one way or the other. Maybe you could do it actually right on the point. But I think in the past, I mean, we've, we've brought this up quite a lot for a lot of options, whether it's like world juniors or wherever. It's just, um, you know, you can't get a permit to run anything at Rocky Point. So, and for uh, good yeah. reason, you know, it's a community and it's challenging. But I, that's interesting. Oh, I, how, I've heard I, I, a lot I, of venues thrown out about where we would run say, the finals that I had many, not heard Rocky how Point. Many, how many armchair commissioners have fucking thrown up their advice on where you can run the WSL finals? That's a better idea. Well, it's funny too. Like, I, I mean, I think we talked about this in the first um, time we had the conversation, but like vaguely related, like the changing, and this isn't just for surfing, but like radically changing media landscape. When I was a kid, you like read the magazine that covers the event, like four months after the fact, like every photo is perfect. So like when you're a kid, you're like, man, like if we go to Fiji, it's just going to be like eight to 10 feet, perfect wind every single day. Like that's, that's what I read. Like these are the photos, like it's never bad. And then, you know, as soon as the webcast started, 
shining a light on the totality of what an event looks like sort of in the mid mid to late 90s and, and onward everyone was kind of caught i think a little bit like there was a little bit of cognitive dissonance between like i always used to be better but it's like no it was always like this we just got like the hyper polished magazine version and and now everyone kind of has to deal with you know these this is the ocean these are like real conditions and yeah for sure there's a lot of armchair commissioners who are like i just want to see 10 events and 12 foot chopu and it's like all right well appreciate the um appreciate that uh, submission to the suggestion box we'll take it take it under advisement um you know one of the one of the things i want to get your opinion on too because it, it's such a unique format um in that you know you're you there you get your shot and you either succeed or you don't and on the women's side i thought brisa who was the only new uh final five member on the uh women's side of things surfed so well like really had steph on the ropes and we all know there's sort of the the stereotype that steph doesn't like to compete in the mornings Maybe it's more than a stereotype, might be a truism, but she was able to kind of rally back towards the end of that heat and move forward. On the men's side, Italo had surfed in the event the year before. He obviously had a good run through the event, um, going from the the fourth seed into the finals. Um, Felipe had surfed there before, but the other three surfers, Kanoa, Ethan, and Jack, I, I would say that they would admit to maybe underperforming or not having the opportunity to perform at the level they wanted to. And I, and I wonder if that's something about like, Hey, it's like, you have to kind of act like you've been here before in this format because it, it, it is sort of psychologically taxing. Oh, I think you have to be a full on like psychopath to be comfortable right off the bat in one of those heats at lowers. You know, you even saw that with Steph. That's why I was so impressed by Brisa. I was like, holy hell, she's a killer. The first 20 minutes yeah. of that heat, I was like, she is gutting Stephanie Gilmore right now. Like, And then you saw Steph put on a really radical comeback. And it, it felt like a, one of those heats that like Brisa is going to be proud of. She knows that like she's one of the only surfers that came out of the gate swinging. And... I mean, you saw Jack's like last wave. He was like finally like kind of put it together and looked sick, loose and like freed up and just like winging it. And that's what I think everyone was expecting from Ethan. Because to me, being at different locations on tour when Ethan's around, to me, he's the most consistently like perfect surfer. Like his whole repertoire is on display on any wave he stands up on, no matter how shitty it is. And so at a wave like lowers to me, he's just like a shoe in for like, perfect formed out like seamless start to finish surfing if it's above chest high um and i think he'd probably be super bummed on you know not delivering that which is whatever he's he's young ethan will be back he's ever there's a lot of people i think that that of a, that appreciate a certain style of surfing that would consider him the best surfer in the world you know him and griffin Totally. And I, and I, I, it's a good thing you bring up too, because I would imagine too, like, you know, I think I, Snips and I talked about this right before the finals and it was like, of all the surfers on the men's side, Ethan felt like he had the largest point of difference in terms of the weapons that he could deploy compared to everyone else. Like everyone's got their own approach, but Ethan's kind of has something that other people didn't. And we didn't really get to see that on display this year. A lot of sliding doors moments. So like, even looking at something like Chopu, like it, it, the event um, developed in a way that um, you know Felipe went down early, Jack was on fire. Like if Jack finishes, I think a few more rounds later, like he becomes the number one seed heading into the finals, and the psychology of that group is so much different. Obviously, he ran into a, a rampaging Nathan Hedge, and 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 it was a different story. But even like the sliding doors thing on the on the women's side, like we started the day with, you know, Steph had seven world titles. Carissa had five. Carissa was in the driver's seat. It was hers to lose. We could have ended the day easily with Carissa at six and Steph still holding seven. As it is now, like Steph moves into eight world titles. She's the women's record holder, eclipsing uh, Lane, who has seven. And Chris is still at five. And and I, I wonder if you've given any thought to like future motivations, like does Steph feel, in your opinion, like, oh, I'm, I've secured my legacy? Is she eyeing Kelly's 11? You know, is Carissa, like we've seen in so many surfers, men's and women's um, in the past, like getting so close to a title and failing to get it, like the regression that often happens the next year because they just go, that took a lot. You know, like, what are you reading on the women's side between Steph and Carissa moving forward? 
I think that anyone in my position who like just appreciates Steph for her like aesthetic approach to surfing would love to see her just go full free surfer with all of the gun power. Like, you know, let me say that again. I would love to see Steph go full like free surf mode with all of the firepower and creative brains behind all of her sponsors, putting her on projects that display her surfing in the most beautiful ways possible. Um, but having, you know, I went to, um, to Italy with Steph filming no contest right after Portugal. And it was like the cruisiest like food tour ever. You know, she was saying that she was losing followers because of how much like pasta she was posting on her Instagram. But the whole time she was like, you know, pretty concerned about the midway cut and stressed about, mm. you know, what having to go and perform. And you can feel that she like still loves winning. Like it is so deep inside of her and it's, and it's, I don't think that it's like a, like a heartbreaker thing that's ever going to happen to Steph. I think she's just going to be able to turn it on when she needs to. And when she feels like she, you know, wants to go out and compete and she can go out and beat anybody. And I think she'll be able to do that for a really long time because her surfing's perfect and it'll always be perfect because it's so technique driven. And it, you know, if she, unless a bunch of like crazy heavy left-hand slab barrels get added to tour, <laughs> uh, which, you know, that's, a kink in most, a lot, you know, a lot of surfers on both sides armors. So to me, watching her surf if, in events is at J Bay or lowers, or I would like to see that for the next ten years. Um, and then it, I'm sure it's that just to, just to interject on that too. Like I, it, it is funny because you and I are, are are a gentleman of a certain age, but it, it like you know the public momentum and discourse. They love to be like, "Yep, we're on washed watch." It's now Carissa Tyler and all these young girls coming up, and and. I did feel like even inside the building when we would have like, you know, marketing conversations or broadcast conversations, narrative conversations, there was a momentum to kind of be like, it's, it's Carissa's time now, you know, Steph's sort of on the twilight of her career. And, and I think I'm like, well, I, I, she's just been winning world titles since I started working here. And so maybe I'm biased and I have to check myself, but I'm like, I still think that on her day, she's a world, world title like uneclipsable kind of surfer you know and i would look back at the 2021 finals and be like man if she had surfed at 70 percent, she could have won the, the title last year too so i i'm with you like i do think that she, if she wanted to she's got like at least another 10 years of like challenging for world titles but she also is one of those surfers too that i love i love watching her just surf whether it's on you know her ferrari thruster or you know alternative craft like we saw in you know electric acid she just does like up at malibu or wherever she's at um i i did interrupt you though i do i want to get your thoughts on on carissa and where you see your heads at after the finals oh i'm sure it'll light a fire under her ass chris is gnarly she's like the most competitive person i know on tour and mm. i think she also thrives on the the like ability to lose and be proud you know proud and psyched for someone like steph and for it to motivate her i think that carissa can win as many world titles as she wants um i don't think that there's really any question about that you know i don't see her ever not being competitive and even with all these young girls coming up like aaron brooks and katie simmers and uh that whole next generation i think that it's still going to be brutal competing against her in real waves you know, it's not going to be this thing where like, oh, all these girls can do airs on every wave. Like it's going to like, it's going to take a long time to get Carissa's claws out of those events. It, it'll be really interesting. I think I'm glad you brought up those young women that are coming up because they're so talented. But, you know, we see this time and again on both the men's and women's side, like all the hype around the young people coming on because they've got they're fresh and they've they've got you know, maybe a progressive edge in some conditions. But I do think something that we, it's a little bit like, you know, Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football, where it's like every time they get on tour, we're like, why aren't they doing that well? And I think collectively we don't appreciate like the speed and the talent at the CT level, like the jump from the, from the challenging series to the CT. And as you said, they run into sort of these alpha predators like Steph or Carissa. And it's like, this is a whole different ecosystem that you have to thrive in after uh you know jack went down in the finals and you were you were you were down there in florianopolis uh, was it what was what was the vibe between you know italo and um and felipe in the finals you know was it pretty split down there was was everyone going for one surfer or the other and 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 once felipe you know iced uh, idlo in the first two matches what was what was the the sentiment on the ground uh 
I feel like a gossip talking about this. <laughs> No, everyone was I mean, on I, full I, Team Felipe. It's crazy. It's far from gossipy, but go on. No, but it, uh, people, I think, were so excited to see Felipe win that world title. You know, I think there's just, it's been so long that he's been the best surfer in the world. Uh, in, like I was saying, like the types of waves that most people appreciate high performance surfing in. Uh, you can make arguments about heavy waves, this, that, and the other, but like, He's such another level of power and precision and like punch in small waves that you, and he's worked his ass off for it. You know, like I just think it's uh, people around the world felt like it was his day. You could just feel the energy get sucked out of the, uh, and you almost felt that from Italo in his uh, interviews and stuff. Like you felt like he knew he was coming up against some like pretty cosmic wins there for that guy that Felipe just sort of had it coming to him. And it was cool to have that play out, you know? Uh, I'm sure it'll light a fire under Italo and, you know, those guys will be battling for the next 10 years, the same thing. I mean, maybe maybe not Felipe, who knows? Maybe Felipe, the same thing, will want to go and free surf and spend more time with his family and do all those other things. Uh, but um, yeah, it was, I think it was, universally appreciated that guy's world title in Brazil. Uh, everyone in Brazil was stoked for Felipe to win that. Before we move off a uh, world title talk and we get to this next segment, um, you know, as a, a, a man of international travel, such as yourself and, and just, you know, and, and, and legitimately like ingratiating yourself into these communities and having your ear to the ground, <sighs> The Brazilian dominance, what let's just say over the next five years, like, do you see that growing? Do you see any other country kind of challenging? Do you see it waning in Brazil? I mean, what, what's your take on, let's just say the men's world titles um, for, for, for where kind of the power centers are at the moment? Oh, I think that the second that Gabby and Italo and Philippe and those guys are a little bit tired and want to go and enjoy their stardom that Matias and Joao and Sammy are going to be demoing people for another 10 years. I think Matias heard he's the easily top three best small wave surfer on the planet, like pound for pound. And Joao and Sammy are like all conditions bruisers. Like those kids are as comfortable at chokes and pipe as most of the veterans on tour. And then can read a backwashy, wobbly, crappy beach break, you know, like a, they're like Jedi's. And those kids, as they get, you know, stronger and more comfortable on tour and, uh, you know, get more, like you said, like this, the jump from the QS to the CT is massive. And yeah, seeing Sammy win rookie of the year, like that lights a fire under Mateus, lights a fire under Joao to get back on tour. Like it's, it, th those kids will be gnarly for a really long time. And a lot of people say that they're like the last of the Brazilian storm, that they don't really know uh, who the next kids after that are. But after spending some time down there, there'll probably be a little gap of, you know, five years between them qualifying and then a next crew of kids. But those three will carry the weight of that entire country. If every other Brazilian retired, those three, I think, would do that for that period of time until that next generation comes behind them. They're gnarly. I like it. So, so even though at what you were saying here is even though Brazilian storm stock is fairly high at the moment, you're still buying. So, um, I'm 100%. interested. I'm interested. We're going to, we're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. So I mentioned it in the upfront. I'm still not hundred percent hours accurate, but, but it, it, for the listeners out there, explain what your job title is and what that means and what you work on week to week, um, just for a scene set before we move into, um, your role with no, no contest. Uh, so I'm the editor at large for stab, um, which for the long, for the, probably the last two years has involved like a sort of myriad sort of number of roles, hosting different shows, helping with, you know, sort of some of the major creative projects as far as the Stab High projects or the Acid Test, which is sort of my baby kind of, that's like my real, like, I don't know, that's like the one project for me that's like the culmination of everything I've ever wanted to do in surfing. So those sort of surfboard based projects I work on a lot. 
And then when I'm doing no contest, and that's pretty much my entire focus, and I'm on the road producing and directing that show and working with Red Bull Media House in Austria with their crew to sort of direct that show and evolve it, um, which is what I've been doing for the past six months exclusively since we finished doing the pickup for Vans in Hawaii with me and Nate and the whole crew over there, I jumped on the road and have been traveling full time just doing no contest, um, which is mainly because of the evolution of the show being a little bit, mm. uh, a little bit more demanding of my time and attention. It's like a 30 minute documentary series instead of a sort of behind the scenes tour show. Um, yeah, so I, I was, well, I was hoping you can talk to everyone a little bit about that too, because I, I, I I, I love that it's evolved. I loved where it was when it started. Originally, it kind of was, a, you know, what you don't see at the events um, in terms of the broadcast, like the free surfs and the culture and the communities and, and a little bit of kind of a, like a no reservation style show, um, which I'd imagine because the framework of the tour was already established wasn't that it was not difficult to do, but it was probably slightly easier to plan out and map out in and around something that existed as opposed to where it's evolved to now, which I'd like you to explain a little bit, because my understanding is that season four of No Contest ended just after a few episodes, you know, with, with Hawaii and Barra de la Cruz. And, and this year you, you guys have evolved it to this point where it's like, it's a, it's a different animal. It hasn't released yet. It's going to be airing on, on Red Bull TV starting on September 29th. What is, what is the show today in terms of where it's been and, and where it is now? So, yeah, it started as, like you said, a behind the scenes tour show. Um, and at that time, I think that, you know, Instagram stories and sort of all these other things weren't as prevalent. So, you got to see a real sneak peek behind what was happening really from no contest and from tour notes in my mind. And those shows sort of, you could get a good sense of what happened at each event. And then it slowly evolved into being a little bit more of like a travel show about going to each of those locations, the local guys from those areas who people interact with when they go there, whether they're photographers or, you know, shapers or, sort of the cultural figures at each location, since there are so many that are so entrenched in all of the spots that you guys go on tour to, um, that don't really have anything to do with the contest. They're just sort of part of the surf scene. And that was where I came in directing a season and then eventually hosting the next season as sort of like the Bourdain or whatever, uh, sort of fish out of water. And we, at that, you know, how do I phrase the, the, um, the shift? So we've done seven seasons now altogether. This is the seventh season. So it's basically an entirely new show from what it started as. And that came from the fact that at this point, we've gone to each location so many times that there's only so many ways you can skin that cat. And there's so many other surf communities around the planet that have these sort of untold stories, but also have this appeal to surfers to want to go and go on surf trips to. And so the idea was to combine a sort of Anthony Bourdain travel show that could take on serious subjects and sociopolitical sort of, you know, ideas and like a Bruce Brown movie and really like take you on a trip and then bring in surfers that I have relationships with or who live in different areas that I've um, wanted to go visit or I've spent time with before and to have them sort of bring us to the people that matter to those areas and help us to sort of paint a real portrait of all those communities from the top down, uh, where they sort of evolved from, what they look like today, and the nuts and bolts of sort of what you need to know if you're going to visit uh, and trying to surf. It's it's interesting, and and it, it, this does flash on I think the conversation we had last time, which was the evolving away from you know what you could argue is an increasingly insular dialogue in the surfing world, you know, in the the probably late oddies and and twenty tens, right? And I think you and I talked about it, like when we were young, you, you 
we kind of both escaped our version of the burbs through surfing where it's like, okay, like I, even if I read this magazine, yeah, I'm interested in the surfing, but it became a window to different countries and cultures and topics of conversation. And of course, it's not like a, a stand in for, for, you know, proper academia or, 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 you know, uh, you know, news reporting um, from those regions, but it was a start. And it's like, this is great. Like, cause you're getting exposed to things you otherwise wouldn't in, in sort of a more homogenized environment. And as we kind of bemoaned, you know, probably when we came up in surf journalism for a period of time there, it was more like, you know, today's expose is fin keys. Do you need him or not? And it's like, no one fucking gives a shit. Um, and so it, it is it is nice to hear, like, I mean, it's in a version of what we try to do very humbly on this show as well, where it's like, hey, we're going to talk about things that are like an, a layer of the onion that's outside that very insular conversation and try to have real conversations about it. Um Obviously, when you do that in the in the current environment, whether it's editorially or 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 you know in content that that you're producing, the community sometimes bristles at it. You know, there's a little bit of a shut up and play or like a shut up and surf response to a lot of it. Have you had to deal with any of that? You know, pre and post no contest, but certainly like moving forward, where you're like, yeah, we're not just going to talk about surfing. How do you like that? Oh yeah, the the show is meant to be a full portrait of what it feels like to live and be a surfer in those areas and people's relationships to surfing and the dynamics within the communities in each of those areas and the different, you know, conflict points that have, you know, arisen in some of those areas. Uh, it's the show is meant to be able to bring in the authorities on those more complex subjects and, sort of bring out the nuance in them instead of it just being sort of clickbaity headlines that you know about an area, you know? We right. went to to Israel, which I have zero preconceived notions about anything about Israeli surf culture, let alone Israeli sociopolitics and uh, anything like that. I was going there just as a full-on sponge, just like open eyes, no preconceptions, and everyone was comfortable wanting to talk about all of those things without me even bringing them up and felt really, really comfortable uh, discussing the nuances of, of even the most, whatever, uh, internationally uh, problematic subjects. And I don't know, like that was Bourdain's secret with food. You know, if you sit down with someone and have a meal, you can get to know them. You ask simple questions and you get a feel for what really matters to them. And each location has real similar threads through all of them. You know, all surf communities have the same concerns and the same people that are, you know, sort of keeping certain flames lit. And it's, for me, it's such a like wonderful opportunity to be able to go to those places and not just go film a surf movie there with a bunch of pro surfers, but to go and make films about the people that you need to encounter when you go to these places that you'd be lucky to sit and have a conversation with and to hear what they have to say about the history of those areas, about the people that came from those areas, the people that have like built the culture um, and yeah, it's their story. Uh, and that's who should be telling it. And so that's, it's my opportunity to sit down with people who I've always wanted to sit down and have conversations with, you know, we get to like sit on the beach at Tavarua with John Roseman and have him tell me the whole story of like being in Tavarua in the early eighties when it was like a, you know, the set for, uh, for Castaway. It's like, right. <laughs> there's stuff where you're like, Oh, this is like, this is the magic, you know, as far as the raw material for storytelling and for taking people on a trip through a surf film. Um, and it's been really, really enjoyable to go to all these different locations and have these local characters bring me and someone like, you know, Steph Gilmore, or Julian Wilson, uh, to really like bring them into the like fabric of what makes their area special. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, uh, the Bourdain thing makes me think of the uh, the recent clip going around when um, 
someone, you know, they're at dinner and someone said in a toast, you know, God save the queen and he didn't drink. And then he's like, I hate the monarchy. And then he drank kind of thing. And it's like, it's, it's so many great moments, but, but you know, it, it's, it is one of those things where, and I think we've talked about this before, whether it's online or offline, I can't remember, but it's like, you know, surfing is, it's an activity and a sport and a culture and an industry that kind of exists almost at the tip of, of privileged society in 2022, right? Like it is, it, it, it's fun, it's enjoyable. It, 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 and how do I want to say this? In a way it's moved so far beyond and the world's moved so far beyond what it was, you know, back during the original endless summer filming, right? Which it's like, yeah, we're just going around the world, having fun surfing. And, and I think as the world in a way has got smaller via the information age, it's like, Hey, that's not good enough anymore. Like you, we can't just put out like surf pornography and expect to be taken seriously because we're going to, you know, regions of, you know, radical economic political violence, like whatever, you know, environmental violence, whatever it is. And we can't pretend to ignore those things, you know, in a way. And and not to say that no contest is going to be diving deep into a lot of these topics, but I think it's an important step that we're addressing it. And as you put it, having having the perspectives told from the people who actually live there. Right. And and it's a little bit like, hey, there's there is a responsible and almost essentially a responsible way to go about being a surfer in 2022 because you can't put your head in the sand and ignore a lot of the the issues that are that are plaguing a lot of communities around the world. Yeah, and at the very least it should be a vehicle for like people's real like the texture of their real lives cuz right. as easy as it is to cuz I don't want it to be, you know, I think that Bourdain was very conscious of this too. I remember seeing in, in the documentary, all the behind the scenes stuff of one of the episodes that he shot in Libya. I'm very conscious of it not ever wanting to be purposefully like tragedy tourism. And mm. I think that there's, you know, there's a fine line there of going and just being like, oh, we're, we're going to go tell this sort of heavy story just for the sake of it. For me, it's about going and finding the local guys who have a real vested interest in those communities and who have done the work to build them and asking them what they think is important to them and having them just speak to it instead of me coming there with a narrative and going oh you're a you know you're an israeli surfer like how do you feel about x y and z in the middle east right it's like i don't know i'd much rather ask you like how you feel about living in this city that's full of all of these different cultures that 99% of the time really enjoy each other's company uh, and why that is, you know, and, and, and hear the, the other part of the story of what it's like to be there. You, f you find that people are very, very happy to tell you about how things feel than how things are, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, we did a profile in Israel on Anat and Noah Lelior. Um, I know that Anat surfed uh, for the Israeli team in the Olympics. And they've been doing the QS events and stuff, and they absolutely rip. They've also served in the Israeli army and mm. have this like amazing childhood growing up in Tel Aviv with their mother, who's an art teacher. And there's like, it'd be so easy to be like, meet these Israeli soldier girls and have people right. think like they're this one thing instead of sitting down for a meal with them and them explaining all of that and taking the time to like have it not just be these little like conversation point things that people have preconceptions about what it means. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense because I, I think in a way it's like finding that balance between of course, you can start, you know, a conversation even via medium like like no contest, where it's like all we're going to do is litigate history. We're going to get you know this story and that story, and and as we all you know painfully understand, like there's so many different perspectives, right? So you can get bogged down and like all we're thinking of is the past, the past, the past. And on the other side of the spectrum, you do things like probably what surfing's done quite a lot over the last few decades, like we're completely apolitical. We're not thinking about anything that came before this wave, right? <laughs> kind of thing. But it's like the sweet spot is, as you pointed out, it's like, hey, we're all here, you know, whether you surf or not, we all have to figure out how to move forward as, as a species. 
it, it cannot be void of the context and past, but at the same time, it can't be so mired in it that we're refused to move forward in, in a way. And, and, and I think kind of the way that you guys are approaching no contest from the sound of it hits that sweet spot in that it's like, yeah, no, like all of that, 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 that story fuels who we're talking to now, but it's, it's very present in, in, in how we're feeling and interacting moving forward. Yeah. I mean, that's what I loved about Bruce Brown's movies was like, you got like a little time capsule of that period, you know, at the very least you're coming away with like a, the, a sense of what that area feels like at the present moment. And then diving into the characters that make that place interesting, giving them enough time to where they really feel like their story is able to be told. And when possible, like trying to do it when the way is really good, which is probably the most unique challenge, I think, to it is trying to like sandwich a surf strike into a documentary right. film <laughs> uh, shoot. Um, the one of the most recent episodes that we just finished shooting, which is going to be the second episode, we went to um, to Fiji with Julian and. It went from like, oh, we're going to go do this casual trip to Fiji when the waves are fun. It'll probably be, you know, 10 days. We'll be cruising around to like, it's almost code red, like biggest swell in <laughs> yeah. two years. Yeah. Like we got to get there in three days. We, there's going to be like waves for a week and then we have to bail out. And those trips are like totally different than say going to Brazil like we just did where we're like cruising 600 kilometers of a coastline for two weeks with a surfer. Um, but the goal is always to make a point to get all of the, the, the characters that can sort of paint a holistic picture of each area to give us a look around their lives and sort of take us through what their realities look like if they're from there. Um, and then if we're bringing a surfer that's not from there for, you know, somebody like, say, in Fiji, we had Tavita Nukilau, who was one of the wild cards into the Fiji contest a few years back. Yeah. Um, you know, we had Tavita take us to Nabila Village and to show us, like, the developments that he's working on with all the locals as far as, you know, to, to host surfers and to, to run boats out to the reefs and stuff. And you're able to, like, really, like, understand how economics and sociopolitics and all these new things are like working on a country that's fairly utopian and simple and that you don't want to see disturbed, that you don't want to see right. overrun. Um, and so it, for me, it's like trying to find places that are a little bit of blueprints for idealism when it comes to surf development to a certain extent and to find those like success stories. Um, you know, in Brazil, it, like, I think my favorite trip that I got to do for the year was definitely going down to, to Southern Brazil, to Santa Catarina, where Mateus Hurdy grew up and Yago Dora and all those guys, um, in Florinopolis and seeing how supportive that community is in real life, like, you know, day to day existence as someone that lives in Floripa you feel like you're a part of a scene that loves surfing and skateboarding and to see what those guys are able to build in their country just for them uh, to support as many of the skateboarders and surfers um, in that country as possible. It's inspiring, man. We, we cruised around with Mateus and with Pedro Barros, um, who he owns a company called Layback, which makes beer and, and runs skate parks all over Brazil. In the last two years, they've built I think 20 parks, they have 16 that are up and running um, and do all this amazing community building and big events that bring skateboarders from all over the world and just started doing, I think they did three QS events with you guys as, as well. Yeah. Um, and this is all just a skateboarder just going, oh, I want to build something that can support surfing and skateboarding, like as the whole point of it. Um, and it's really, it, it feels like DIY like roots core surf culture down there and skate culture um and for me that's like that's what i'm like always trying to find you know i think that people are, are so worried of the the sort of atomization of that world as surfing mm -hmm. becomes more mainstream um that for me to find places that are building inclusive culture that feels true to the roots and to the and like to the culture that raised us and made us want to go be surfers. Um, those are the stories that I'm like so excited to share with this series.
Oh, it sounds amazing. So we're all looking forward to it. It's going to be airing on uh, Red Bull TV starting on September 29th. Uh, let's switch gears for a second. You have what I think is season four of the Electric Acid Surfboard Test. First one was Dane, then Noah, then Mason Coco, and now Mick. Is that right? Am I missing anyone? Dane, Steph, Noah, Mason Coco. Steph. This is the fifth. I missed Steph. That's right. Fifth yeah. one. Excuse me. And tell, tell us about it. It's a derivative of Stab in the Dark, but for the listeners who are uninitiated, it's, it's really cool. I want to I get your, your log line on it. So the acid test for me was an extension of just sort of my life spent working in surf shops that sold slightly obscure surfboards and my interest in seeing surfers who traditionally ride high performance shortboards get on a you know as many different sort of paths as possible on one trip and see which ones they dug and the first one we did with Dane, um, when I brought the project to Sam McIntosh, uh, me being a like purist, I was like, oh, you can get someone like a Mikey February or an Asher. And he's like, everyone always sees those guys ride those boards. Let's get Dane to do it. Uh, which of course would have been my dream, but like, it'd be like if I was, I don't know, trying to do a basketball project. And I was like, oh, I want to have Michael Jordan test out shoes. You know, it's like, <laughs> right, yeah it's going to be a, a tall order, but Dane was down to do it. And the first project for me was, that was really my first surf movie. And Dane edited that for us. And I think it's some of the best surfing he's ever done. And for me, it was really validating to see someone like Ryan Birch or Matt Parker, um, or even the Neckbeard beard two from channel islands get like revalidated and sort of thrust into the mainstream conversation about surfboards for people that were serious about performance surfing um, who might not have really been interested in quote unquote alternative surfboards. Um, the next year was Steph in Mozambique, which Steph can ride anything. And that project was just fun because it was just so much like color and like style and like just sort of raw material to work with. We had Alberto Boff do the soundtrack and that project was just like magic to make because Steph's so easy to work with and so fun to watch surf on anything. Um, and also for Simon Jones to win that, who I think is also one of the most <laughs> radical, sweet, cool geniuses to ever pick up a planer. Um, and it's been really cool to see his profile like become what it is. He's He handshapes every surfboard that he makes and he's got a wait list that's probably... <laughs> I don't know, two years long now. Um, and those are the people that should, you know? Uh, so he, um, yeah, it's, Steph picked Simon and hers. The next year we did Noah in Hawaii. Peter Schroff won uh, the <laughs> controversial, iconoclastic San Pedro character. Um, and then we did with Mason and Coco last year, which was, was that last year? God, it's so weird how the years get mixed up. But yeah, we did Mason and Coco uh, yeah. and Selena Cruz last year. And Simon and Matt Parker from Album One uh, with Mason and Coco, respectively. Um, and so to me, Stab in the Dark is like a very pure project. You know, it has its like very aimed goals. The acid test has always been had a little bit of ambiguity around it. So there's been room to play here and there with the concept. You know, it's not necessarily about finding the best surfboard in the world. It's about trying to like turn somebody on. And this year, Sam McIntosh, who loves to throw his wrenches into things creatively because he's the most fucking disruptive genius that I've ever worked with when it comes to certain things. He just came in and goes, he wrote this pitch about how some of the best music has come from these like disruptive collaborations, you know, and he was like bringing up like Eminem and, uh, Elton John and stuff like that, you know, and just like all these different, like, <laughs> well, that, that was his number one musical disruption reference. And just like, you know, bringing up these mashups and he's like, what's, what if we had shapers work together? And yeah. immediately my mind just starts going to like the different narratives that you can draw between shapers. And I was on the road doing no contest at the time. So Taylor Paul, who's mix like one of his closest friends, um, took on this project and just smashed it we came up with the shapers and then he ran with it. And I felt like a, uh, a very like admiring, uh, neglectful stepfather to that project because it's just <laughs> been Taylor and Mick and Dylan Roberts all the way. And they killed it with Mick, um, 
all of the the conversations between the shapers to me is like such a fun fun house mirror to hold up to the shaping process um and you get like a real sense for the personalities and the egos and the sort of pride that shapers take in their own ideas and what and their willingness to be flexible um and it just added this whole new element to it so it's been it's been really cool to see that come together i'm staying right down the street from joey falcone who was in last night's episode um who's been here shaping in new york working with every shaper that's ever come through new york city um on boards and for him to sit down with matt parker and shape a board like you know west coast east coast mashup uh it's just like really fun to see these people whose boards I've admired or who I've known for a really long time working together um, and making really cool boards that I think that are going to end up being available to the public. There's going to be some models available from the better performing boards and um, some surfers will be actually able to go and like try them, which will be cool. It is cool. And as you pointed out, like in that early sort of iteration with like, Although I'd argue that Dane was probably uh, more open-minded in terms of board design um, than a lot of CT surfers were at the time. But like going back to Sam's point of like, we see all these other surfers surf alternative craft all the time. The the magic is going to be getting someone like a Dane or, or a Steph or a Noah, or especially in this case, like a Mick, who, especially when he was on tour, you never saw him diverge from his sort of premium Ferrari model. And surf these different boards and these different lines. It's so, so cool. It's such an awesome series. I, it's, I look forward to it every season. It's someone who's been so close to it. Is there a particular board slash performance that stood out to you as like, that was amazing? And then related question, have you, have you adopted any of those creations in your own quiver in terms of favorite? It might be the same one or it might be a different one. Yes, I I pretty much lie to all the shapers and say that we need like a 32 liter version of every board that I want. No, <laughs> yeah. no. no, but I I I I have been like so stoked to work with all these shapers because my dreams have always been to have all these different boards. To me, it's like having it's like I don't know if you were a carpenter, you'd want all the tools that you could get in your shed. Um, but performances, yeah. I mean, Dane's first performance in the acid test in Mexico was like an epiphany for me. The first day we got there, it was like six to eight foot at Escondida and he was riding the birch and it was just like, I don't know. I don't know what it was like for Sonny and Miller to watch Tom Curran, like take off on that black beauty or something at J Bay. But it was like, for me, it was that moment. It was like, mm. holy shit, we put this all together. And Dane just paddled out straight into like four of the most like on rail committed, crazy turns I've ever seen in person. Um, and then just seeing the project come together and Dane being interested in it enough to edit it. Um, and then being able to do all the individual shaper profiles, it was like that project, that performance, it was like, I knew that we could do that forever. Like we could make that, we could use those, that combination of like, find the best performance surfer in the world who understands surfboard design and put them on boards that have a good story and that are part of a design lineage that you are interested in. Um, yeah. Well, you, 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 you were vaguely blasphemous in your comparison to, to Sonny and Tom, but we'll let that slide. You still ducked my question though. Nope. What was, what, what was, what, 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 well, I guess you said Birch, Birch and Dane. I, actually, and, and in fairness, I'm just being funny. Like it was a fairly transcendent moment, like to watch that, um, in the show. So I'm glad you, you, you identified that one. And I know you got to be a little bit Switzerland so you can keep getting free surfboards, but is there one particular board at the moment from any of the electric acid surfboard tests? It's like, you know, any day that I want to go out, like that's my go-to in, in terms of the alt crafts that I've gotten. Yeah. I have a Panda Shiitake Twinser. Mm. That's like a, I, I pulled it from Noah's acid test because him and I are right. like close to the same size and it's like a one board quiver for me traveling. It's such a sick board. Uh, and I just think longer fishes for me, like longer performance fishes. Like there's been a few in the project. Eden Saul from Dead Kooks made a channel bottom for Mason that I grabbed um, that was a slightly bigger version of a, it was a replica of it that's I've taken around the world. 
And then honestly, this I think that Simon Jones's channel bottom triple stringer like tube shooters, those Fiji boards that he does, mm. are pretty hard to beat. And I've spent the last year with two of those in my board bag and haven't left without them. They'll like handle anything you throw at them. It's a very cool series. I actually, I sent um, Mayhem a text after, I think it was episode three of this season. And I said, man, that the mixtape collab that you did with Donald Brink and the way Mick was surfing looks so sick. Like it's just, it is a very cool series. I recommend everyone check it out. That was my, that's my favorite Mayhem cameo in any of our films so far was him working with Brink on that project. He feels like, I feel like he's entered into a new phase. He's like very kind. He's got the hair going. He seems very zen, like uber collaborative, like dry wit still there. But he's, I feel like he's moving into his like Frampton unplugged phase um, is like a shaper in a way. Like it's very interesting to see having known him for as long as I have. I love it. The evolution of Matt Violas. We all, we all got to evolve. Um, okay, we're going to take one more break, and we'll be right back. Um, don't go anywhere. Well, you, you've been very gracious uh, with us, both with your time and insights, um, not only about you know, the state of high-performance surfing in, in, on the championship tour, but you know, in these awesome content projects you're working on, whether it's no contest or the electric acid surfboard test. You know, it's something that I think you and I talk about a lot, both online and offline, but you know, the, the, the current state of like surf journalism is kind of a dirty phrase in a way, but I guess like storytelling in the surfing world, because it is a microcosm of like storytelling and journalism, like well outside the surfing world, because things have changed so much. Where do you see your own kind of personal career going in the sense of, is it more of these no contest kind of vehicles and projects like the electric acid surfboard test? Is there another chapter for you in terms of a medium or, 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 or kind of narrative focus that you want to work on. I'm, I'm just curious because you've, you've been able to kind of evolve and matriculate through the editorial realm in such an impressive fashion. It's like, okay, well, is it, have you reached kind of the, the Zenith here in terms, and you're just going to kind of refine and optimize that for yourself? Or is there like another kind of, I don't know, constellation um, in terms of storytelling that you're looking at? Um, no contest is like my dream show to work on, you know, growing up as a writer, seeing what Anthony Bourdain did in food and like having it be a vehicle for seeing the world was like, oh, okay, like that's like the dream. And it, it, when it sort of fell into my lap, the project, I was like baffled, you know, all of a sudden you have to, it's like, I felt like a car or let me say this. When that project fell in my lap, I felt like a dog that had been like chasing a car and finally caught it. You know, you're like, oh, what do you do with it? Now you have to like try and like make a travel show as a host and learn how to do this. And I, you know, it's been a few years now and I feel much more comfortable in those in that position um, because the show has evolved to be more about other people's stories and less about my experience of behind the scenes at the world tour. And I feel like the show's evolution is so intelligent that it really re-engaged me in a way that I could see myself doing it for as long as they'll let me. Because I do think that there's an unending list of places that would be incredibly interesting to make shows like this at. Um, on the other side, yeah, the, the acid test is always going to be like the closest thing to my heart when it comes to like surfboard projects. And I try to help out wherever I'm useful um, on stab projects. A lot of times with the way that media needs to be produced and disseminated, I feel like a bull in a china shop in that uh, office nowadays because we have such an incredible, efficient, young crew of talented guys that have come on and in the last two years as we've sort of recognize that we have this business model now that requires a very large team of people to produce content at the pace that we're doing it. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like really good disconnecting from it a little bit and seeing what Matt Baker and Danny Johnson and Sam do with all of our editorial crew, as far as Mikey and Will Stiles and, um, Blake Michelle and Hayden Williamson and, and our creative director Shinya 
they're just like such a well-oiled machine and the projects now have, they sort of stand on their own. So it's just a matter of planning and execution and production and me trying to be useful when I can be, when I'm not working on no contest. So right now I'm like touring and doing premieres and trying to do production on no contest. And those guys are pretty much all hands on deck doing stab high and are, you know, neck deep in the biggest project of the year. And they've got it like they're they've got the best team working on it that could pull it off. Um, so it's it's cool to be a part of it, but to not be um, either a center point around which a lot of it oscillates or a speed bump in the way sometimes. And for me to be able to just focus on the stuff that I'm really, in my opinion, better at, which is shows like this um, and then working on the bigger creative projects that are in my wheelhouse as far as surfboard design and documentary style sort of history films like Andy Irons and that kind of stuff. Um, right. And that's creatively where I see myself doing stuff for as far as stab goes for sure. That makes sense. You, you said something that, that struck me before about, you know, I had to learn how to do it and I had to evolve alongside the show. And, and I, I do think there's kind of that, that 10,000 hours philosophy too, because same thing similar with the podcast, really anything you're like, well, like we have these conversations all the time. Let's just mic us up. It should be easy. And then it's like, I, I, I always compare like how it felt and how it went, you know, those first few. And now that we're in like, you know, past a hundred episodes, it's like, oh yeah, we had no idea what we were doing before, even though going into it, I'm like, yeah, I'd probably do that. And I imagine it's not dissimilar with, as you said, like I was chasing this car and I finally caught it in your head. You're like, I'm a good traveler. Like I know people like this will be maybe easier than I think it will actually be. And then you get into it and you're like, Oh no, like I'm going to have to get better along with these seven seasons. Was, did you find that was the case as well? Or? Oh, a hundred percent. And it's, it's really just like figuring out what tools you've got to sharpen and, mm. you know, producing a show where you're, it requires the participation and the like positive energy of surfers from all around the world. It, just makes me like shift into like a certain mode where I'm just trying to be as accommodating and as productive and as useful as possible when I'm on those shoots and trying to organize things. And it's, a, you know, it's just a million moving targets. And I have a tendency to say yes to everything and to find value or a story in, you know, pretty much anywhere I look when I'm at these locations. And so I feel like I've gotten better at like coming in and focusing what I want to do when I'm at a location and knowing how to get there. Um, whereas before I just felt like I was just like this, you know, this sponge just getting bounced around, absorbing what was going on and then trying to communicate that experience, um, in the, in each episode in a very like short period of time with this new season. Um, you know, we had six months to go and shoot them and to spend time sourcing archival imagery and really writing proper scripts and making sure that, each episode has an arc to it and, you know, not a message, but a takeaway that feels like you've learned something. Um, it feels much more like purposeful and more like what I would, you know, want to put out if I had the time to do it. Um, and I'm really grateful to Anthony Sedgwick and Josh um, Walker at Red Bull who really like saw the vision for it, you know, that really went to bat for the idea of a travel show. Uh, and have been so hands-on and helpful with shaping it so that it feels like it's fair and like a real, like honest attempt at a documentary series um, instead of just, a, like you said, just sort of travel and surf porn. It's very, very cool. And as we mentioned, you know, No Contest is going to be airing on uh, Red Bull TV September 29th for for this season. Can you just give us a rundown of the locations again before we move on to our, our next segment? Yeah, so they're going to be released in three episode chunks. The first three episodes are New York, Fiji, and Italy. And then the last three are uh, Pavones, Southern Costa Rica, um, Brazil and Israel and those come out in November um, and we'll be doing premieres. We just did a premiere in Israel um, at the Tel Aviv Surf Film Festival and we're premiering the New York episode here in the city this week at Pilgrim 
uh, on the 20th and at Unsound Surf in Long Beach, who you would have worked with back in the day at the, uh, the, the 2010 event um, at their shop in, uh, down the street from Balaram's house. Um, yeah, that's the show. I love it. Well, everyone should be checking that out. Um, we, uh, we did put a feeler out for questions in the Instagram community at, um, at the lineup pod. So thanks to everyone who wrote in, uh, first question is from at Cress C Bailey, who asks, what is the number one way to pass the time waiting for your flight at an airport? That's Chris in New Smyrna. That kid's epic. He's uh, I've met that <laughs> I've met him at the Florida Surf Film Festival. What's the best way for me to kill time at the at the gate? He said. That's his question. Oh, uh, airports are the best place to be productive ever. Um, <laughs> so I there's I literally it. nothing else you want to do there. <laughs> it's just wait around. I, I've had to like I remember reading somewhere that uh, the writer Jonathan Franzen like tore out all the USB ports and all the internet ports out of his computer so he could just write. And I obviously can't do that. So I just carry a giant notebook and I sit and write or come up with like edits to things that I've been working on in my head and try and like just focus for about 45 minutes at a time. And then, yeah, a Bloody Mary at the bar, very underrated. Well, and I mean, those don't seem like mutually exclusive activities. Mm. They actually it, go it very is well funny. together. It is funny how the Jonathan Franzen thing, it's like, he like if, if humanity survives the current phase we're in, I'd imagine that academics will look back on, on this period of time and be like, man, they just free base technology with zero thought. <laughs> like it was just kind of to the point where someone like Jonathan friends is like, I can't trust myself if I have access to the internet. So I physically have to like, like damage my opportunity to access it for me to do the thing. <laughs> kind of, it's like, yeah, we're kind of there. I think at this point. If, if any society in history beyond the last 20 years had whatever, a third of its productive waking hours used by something completely non-productive, they would have all fucking starved to death. Yeah. Well, you know, we're on our way. Um, okay. That was a great answer. Thank you, Chris. Um, and, and Chris actually writes it to me all the time. It's, um, I've not met him, but I'm a big fan. I, I appreciate all of his questions. Uh, Epic second kid. question is from uh, at Andy Cashford, who asks, what's the mark of any great story in the world of surfing? Oh, this is an existential kind of question. Hmm. I mean, that is a very existential question. I don't know. I just think I, I always enjoy a story where you get a sense for why surfing is such a uniquely important thing to the person, like what it is that they get out of it or if it's, if it's a release from and how it intersects with their life. Um, I'm always interested in like how a person's reality intertwines with whatever my sense of a surfing reality is. Is that a really ambiguous answer? That's a good answer? answer. No, I think it's fair. I think it's good. I, I'll, I'll pile on too. Like I, I like that answer a lot. I always kind of inside the building, um, you know, and my, my success rate, I wouldn't say is over 50%, but I always say, you know, if you remove all the surfing parts of the story and it's still really good, that's a good story. You know, the surfing stuff should kind of be additive. And of course, like we focus on, you know, live performance surfing in in the arena there which is important but on all the kind of biographical stuff i'm always like there's like and as you know which is sort of great for no contest it's like there's no shortage of awesome kind of transcendent stories that would be great even if there was no surfing involved in the story so it's kind of like you focus in on that and then the surfing colors around it and it makes it that much more interesting um, yeah from a, from a film a standpoint question, we're though. always we're always uh running it by our non-surfing partners you know if we're always right. trying to find someone who's like a somewhat voracious consumer of you know media in general who might not surf and if they're interested in it then it's worth fucking talking about i love it uh last question that we we we've picked from the uh at the lineup pod uh instagram community is from i am matson who asks when will stab finally use a goofy foot for a stab in the dark or the electric acid surfboard test so actually i did not realize this before i read the question but um 
Yeah, it does seem a little bit discriminatory now that we're thinking about it. It's the biggest scandal in surfing. <laughs> Uh, I hope this year, the answer to that question is I hope this year and I hope that it's the surfer that everybody wants to see. Um, and yeah, it's crazy. We've had done all these surfboard projects. We've never had goofy footers. And that's one of those things that like Mikey, I think brought up a while back, just like from his, you know, computing brain. It's just like, by the way, we've never had a goofy foot when everybody was like, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, that's why we pay you the big bucks, Mikey. Thank you for calling that out. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. I, I mean, I, and not that I would ever want to star in anything, but if you need like a control agent for any of these tests of like a below average surfer that is a goofy foot, consider me. I'm happy to go to uh, to Mexico or the Maldives or Indonesia or wherever you want to do it. Um, Noted. All for well, it. All for I'm gonna it. Write, I'm going to write that down. Pro Dan yeah. is down. Yep. That's on my on my gravestone. We want that. I'm. Mm. Uh, um, well, excellent. I, 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 I cannot wait. And I'm, and I'm, I'm curious as to who the goofy footer will be, since it sounds like you guys are eyeing someone in particular. Um, we're now down to the final segment, which is the, the lightning round presented by BF Goodrich. So these are 10 questions that you have answered before, but I'd imagine things have changed, um, because you've changed, uh, since you've done it last time. Um, First question, if you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Quad. Coffee or tea? <laughs> coffee. Burrito or pizza? Ace, eight, eight, ace coffee. Oh, okay, yeah, get your plugs in. Uh, pizza. Last book you read? The Overstory by Richard Powers. Have you read it? I have. And did it change your life? In certain ways, it did. It's a great, mm. it's a great read. Highly recommend. Highly recommend. I feel like people probably think I've lost my mind at times. I'm just like wandering around, staring up at trees. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I mean, <laughs> it's, there are worse ways to spend existence, in my opinion. I'm into it, though. Um, best surf film ever? Five, five, nineteen and a quarter. The original, not the Redux. The original, not the Redux. Okay, no, not not shaming the Redux. We're just, I'm just clarifying. I'm sure last uh, time I said something like Sea of Darkness or Heavy Water or something like that. Yeah, yeah so surf you know, film, you get your, you like know, straight Bonifides. surf video, because you kind of there's yeah, yeah. categories to that. There's surf films yeah, yeah, and there's it. surf videos. What are we talking here? Wow, I I like your answer. I'm I'm into right. it. Well, I, I I think it's more of a whatever's the first thing in your brain when that question comes out. But yeah, I yeah. get I get. There's like the video. There's the VHS video like pornography side of it, and then there's the sort of the the artistic like film based version of it. When but yeah, I'm when I die, it. five, and five my five's li- fantastic. When I die and my life flashes in front of me, and there's like the moment where I reflect on what was important to me about surfing, it'll be the YMA Bay. Shore break session yeah, to bad just breaks. Be Andy Corey on the loop. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, oh well, uh, uh, through the gates of Valhalla. Um, uh, where am I at? What is one wave you never have to go back to? Hmm. Venice Breakwater. Mm, that's an honest answer. If you only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life. Probably Jeffrey's Bay. Interesting. Best person to share a lineup with? My wife. Worst person to share a lineup with? Me or Mikey Ciramella. On a surf trip that we're not being paid to surf on. Sure. Makes sense. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, Last one. Uh, Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Mm, settling in and enjoying my new life in Hawaii. Uh, we just moved into our first house, me and my wife, uh, over on the west side of Haleiwa. And we have this little one-bedroom cottage over by a couple of waves. And I'm able to work from there and come and go when I need to. And I'm, it's the first time I've been settled in five years, six years, really. So it's a yeah. new chapter. 
Well, congratulations. That sounds amazing. And Ashton Goggins, you know, thank you so much for coming back on the lineup. It's been far too long uh, between drinks, both literally and figuratively. Hasn't um, it been? Yeah, but more more to come. I feel like I feel like transformation for our relationships around the corner. I, I mean, congratulations on all your success. All the listeners should absolutely check out No Contest uh, premiering on Red Bull TV on September 9th and go immediately and watch the electric acid surfboard test and all the electric acid surfboard tests. And um, yeah, man, I appreciate your time and, and your friendship. I look forward to seeing you soon. I appreciate you too, man. Thank you so much for the time. And it's good to see your face, brother. Hopefully it happens in person soon.